Today's panel consists of uh, three early stage entrepreneurs that have all recently come out of Stanford. Uh, they are Atasha Cave, PhD in mechanical engineering and co-founder of Opus 12. Caitlin Albertoli, bachelor's candidate and co-founder of Buzz Solutions. And Sonia Baltadano, PhD candidate in mechanical engineering and founder of Scrapworks. We're gonna start the panel by having each of them introduce themselves briefly and describe what it is that their companies do. So maybe we'll start at the far end and move our way down, Natasha. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so I graduated um, a few years ago from the mechanical engineering department, but I did my research in chemical engineering. And I, we basically are now um, scaling up what was my, uh, was my research was on the basic science side. And basically what we do is we uh, create higher value products out of carbon dioxide. So you can imagine taking CO2 emissions and making things like plastic and diesel fuel out of it. And we develop that technology that can do that. And we use metal catalysts and electricity to effectively break apart CO2 and water into smaller atomic bits and then reform those atomic bits into these new molecules, which again are plastic and diesel fuel. Um, so right now we, um, we have some space out in Berkeley. Um, we did a, a two year incubator program called Psychotron Road out of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So that gave us um, um, some initial support beyond the Tomcat grant that we got through Stanford. And so now we're working on our first product, which um, we're targeting for early next year to come out. We have our manufacturing partner that's in Connecticut. So uh, we'll have our first uh, dishwasher size reactor that'll convert about 40 kilograms of CO2 per day. And then we'll scale up to something that's the size of a whole plant that can do tons per day of CO2 conversion. Thank you. Um, so I am one of the co-founders of Buzz Solutions, and we actually came out of a class here at Stanford last spring. Um, so we partner with large drone service providers um, to inspect transmission lines, so the big power lines that are out in the middle of the fields. Um, and then Buzz Solutions brings the predictive analytics to that, so we can tell you where and when a line's going to break down. So we're working to prevent forest fires, such as the large fires that happened this past fall, um, in Santa Rosa, we're working to prevent power outages. And then there's about 50 deaths per year um, in the US alone in line inspections. Uh, the current way that um, the lines are inspected is through helicopters. So they actually fly helicopters really close to the power lines, and then they'll take pictures with cameras. And so um, we're working to uh, use drones for that solution now. And um, we're able to use different kinds of sensors to actually tell you not only what's happening around the line, but what's also happening inside to prevent um, power outages before they even start and to keep those um, linemen that are usually in the helicopters on the ground in, um, in safer environments. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Sonia. I earned my master's through the joint program in design, which has recently evolved into the design impact program. And my PhD is through the Center of Design Research, and we focus on autonomous human vehicle interactions. But Scrapworks, my company, is really focused on increasing the efficiency within complex supply chains, especially in the food supply chain. And this came out of my joint program in design master's thesis work, where we were trying to understand why there was so much waste occurring in the production cycle of food. And one of the major reasons is because it's relying heavily on human intuition for a variety of reasons, mostly because people don't know how to leverage the the uh, data streams they already have available to them. And often those... Oh, those data streams uh, may not even be digitized. So what we do is we provide ways to ingest these data streams in a digital way that allow us to use predictive algorithms to also understand where the inefficiencies lie and how they can even run their innovation and strategy in, in such a way that production and demand are really meeting each other and they're not kind of scared that they're gonna lose sales because they're not overproducing. Because that's always the, the thing that I've learned the food industry is really terrified of is that we prefer to have excess so that we can guarantee a sale. And so we're saying you don't have to have that, make that choice anymore. Great, so I'm gonna ask some questions and I, I mean, you each can jump in when you'd like to answer, but let me start with um, the following. Was starting a company what you expected and were there any surprises? <laughs> um, I would say before I started diving into it, um, um, I, had a, I had a very different vision of what starting a company was. I thought it was more of this 
brute force, like you write a 50 page business plan and then you just like execute, execute, execute on that business plan and then if you, if you work really, really hard, you'll, you'll be successful. And in doing some of the entrepreneurship courses here at Stanford before I graduated, I realized that it's actually a lot more fun than that. Um, I think um, Joan mentioned this, the whole business model canvas and the lean startup. Um, you know, you're bringing design thinking into um, how, you're, how you're forming this entity and like being strategic about financing and about you know, how you're gonna hire people and build your team. And that can be really, really fun and really creative. Um, and so um, I would say that was like, it's been a big surprise mm -hmm. for me as, as well as I've, I've moved along. I think another surprise too, um, you know, toward, again, as we were initially first starting the company, um, there was actually this app that had came out back then called Yo, and the team had raised a million dollars to build this app. So I kind of felt like, oh, well, this app can get a million dollars. We could easily get a million dollars from venture capital. Mm -hmm. We're actually doing something that's meaningful, you know, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> But that was not quite the case. Um, we actually, because we only had an idea, and because it was at the tail end of this massive clean tech funding, like this venture capital was not investing in clean tech anymore because of failures like Solyndra and that kind of stuff. And so it was, it was really difficult to raise money in the kind of traditional way. So we had to go back to the drawing board and be more strategic. And so uh, leaning on philanthropic sources initially, then uh, going through government grants, and now recently we've been able to attract uh, private funding as we were starting to build our first commercial product, and we have that those financial cost models and the revenue showing that we can, you know, uh, be a profitable company. Um, so that was something too that um, we had to kind of reset and realize that, you know, there's going to be a different path for us to raise money. Great. So Caitlin, do you want? To yeah, I think um, definitely was not what I expected mm -hmm. either. Um, coming so coming out of a class here at Stanford, we launched. We had like our financial models built. We had our go-to-market strategy ready to go. Um, and then we actually found ourselves in this almost like a feedback loop. We were going after these customers and we were able to get our, our foot in the door to get meetings with them through our Stanford connections, but we didn't have a prototype ready. <clears throat> and that was something that was really difficult for us because in order to actually buy our own drones and really get that out the door, we needed some type of capital. But in order to raise capital, we needed some type of customer. And so that really um, kind of spun us back and forth. We tried to figure out how we were going to break out of the cycle and actually uh, really get our feet moving forward. Um, and so luckily, we were able to um, secure like a pre-seed amount of funding from an accelerator, which not only provided us connections to multiple power utilities um, in the city of Columbus, Ohio, which is now a smart city, um, but it also helped us actually get our first prototype out the door and then um, help us gain more customers. Sorry. Likewise, I came from a program that was very focused on finding, in, in a way, product market fit, product uh, need fit, and realizing that's a very different thing to find product market fit and product funding fit. Because we had a working prototype that was developed at Stanford. But understanding how to build a model that spoke to investors was a really different thing. And for us, the secret was understanding the ecosystem that Scrapworks could really live within and broaden our own understanding of what the application of the product was. We used to talk about what we did in terms of reducing food waste, which it does do, but it turns out you can sell increasing sales a lot better than you can sell <laughs> reducing food waste. And the math is the same. It's just um, understanding of that suddenly became, and not even from a customer perspective, it was almost in telling, you have to find a new way to tell a story mm -hmm. for the investment community that is distinct from the story that you tell your customers. And, and that was something that was unexpected mm -hmm. for me. You've each uh, mentioned various classes and experiences you had here at Stanford. I'm, I'm wondering if you look back, what were some of the most helpful groups, programs, or classes that you took for this particular venture that you're all doing now? Yeah, so I would say in terms of learning about entrepreneurship, I took the Lean Startup course that uh, Steve Blank taught, and that, that was uh, almost like a startup simulation. And the idea that we had during that class um, uh, did not end up moving forward at all, but it, it was still a good way to, to see like building this business model canvas and like how do you de deploy um, a product and, get, and find a product market fit. Uh, so that was a, a huge advantage. I also did the Excel Innovation Scholars Program, which is for PhD students, uh, post-quals, and you spend a year kind of um, 
interviewing and, and talking with other startups and kind of getting a sense of how these different startups came about. So that was, that was a really helpful uh, program as well. I also did Ignite. I think it's a different name now, but maybe not. It was a month long kind of, I call it a micro MBA program uh, over the summer, where it's a full time one month. Um, it's for non-MBA students and you actually learn about technology transfer. And in that program I actually you brought in the idea of like, hey, we're going to make something useful out of CO2 and had a team of people working on that idea. So that's kind of how we got our initial uh, cost model made. And we certainly pivoted from that, but that was, that was a, a huge help. In terms of getting the, this um, uh, Opus 12 off the ground, uh, certainly talking with Brian. So I, if anyone's thinking about doing an idea in clean tech, definitely have coffee with Brian if, uh, if you're available. Uh, he was, uh, um, after a clean tech event here, I went and spoke with him over coffee. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm thinking about starting a company out of this idea, what do you think? And, and uh, Brian was super helpful in kind of encouraging uh, me to put the team together and getting everything going. And then we eventually applied for a Tomcat grant. That was our first uh, funding in for the I idea. Um, and then we you know, got into Psychotron Road after that. Um, I could talk a little bit about the class that um, our company came out of. It's called um, Entrepreneurship and Civil Environmental Engineering here, and it's a graduate class. It's actually taught by um, four angel investors um, slash VC um, and also professors. So it's a great combination, actually. And um, the class basically is you come up with an idea and you form a team, and then um, every three weeks you pitch to a different panel of investors. You build your entire go-to-market strategy, and then you talk to a whole bunch of um, CMOs, and then uh, you build your five-year financial models, which is an experience in and of itself, um, and that's just a, such a valuable learning experience. And then you um, pitch to a panel of CFOs, and then at the end of the course, you pitch to a panel of investors um, who can actually invest in your company. And so throughout the course, you get um, amazing mentorship. You're actually paired with two mentors, um, each team is throughout the class. And so our idea really came, like it developed so much throughout the course. We were originally going to tackle the maintenance industry and then found out that the um, the market wasn't quite there at the time, and so um, then we really pivoted, and that was through the help of the mentors and the professors in the class, and um, Stanford has just been incredible to give the um, resources and mentorship at such an early stage in the startup. Great. Okay. I, I also agree that in part just the Stanford environment, there are so many people here that are really excited to help you explore what your dreams are and help you explore your own potential. Like, I have never felt so supported as I have in this university. And people are okay with you changing your ideas and they're excited for your ideas to evolve so you don't have to like marry yourself to the one thing and then say, like, I'm gonna be this and it's the only way to justify myself in these conversations. People are excited to see how you're changing. Practically speaking, I've been very tied to the D school. Uh, launch, lean Launchpad, I think it was the official mm -hmm. term. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually offer, offer office hours on, I believe it's on Tuesdays from three to five. You can look them up online throughout the year. And you can show up even if you're not planning on taking the class and say, hey, I've got this idea. What do you think? And they'll just give you this really quick feedback. It's not the last word or the first word, but it's a, it's a way that you can just sort of start exploring what what you might want to do, how you might want to move forward. Um, the principles of quick iteration that Stanford espouses I think is really helpful. And I've also found, I'm also a member of Stardex, mm -hmm. which is a program that is officially not Stanford, but it often has many Stanford students and Stanford affiliates inside of it. I highly recommend everyone to check it out. Um, even just to come by and, and get to know the resources that are available for you there. And there's a surprising amount of money at Stanford if you, uh, <laughs> that I just wasn't aware of it for like, I think a good three years here. I didn't realize all of the financial support that was available for young seed stage kind of ideas or pre-seed stage ideas. Um, we were funded by the Stanford Green Fund Grant. We are part of Tomcat. And th just between those two, it was really um, transformative to just have a little bit of money to start s seeing an idea become real. Great, we like to hear that. <laughs> so you, um, you've each spoken to suggestions on classes or activities here at Stanford. I, the last question, because we want to have time to bring everybody back up here for audience questions, is um, 
What words of advice would you give to somebody who was thinking of starting a company? Maybe we'll start with Sonia and go back the other way. Start early, fail fast, try again. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's really good. <laughs> um, I say take the chance because you'll never know until you try. And it's such an exciting opportunity to learn from a startup. And you just learn so much so quickly. So being able to just go for it, um, especially if you have the resources like a place here at Stanford does, then I would just say take the chance. I would say that team matters a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I don't quite understand how solo founders do it. I, I, um, I've i leaned heavily on the, my other two co-founders, Kendra Cool, who I did my PhD with, and then Nicholas Flanders, who is in the business school here. Um, it's just been so helpful to have an amazing team in place. And so I would say um, if you're looking to find co-founders, um, while you're at Stanford, it's a great time to do it. It's, it's going to be even harder once you, if you, once you leave Stanford and you don't have a co-founder. Um, you find someone, but find some way to work together on a meaningful project before you commit, because mm -hmm. it's also you can um, think you have a great team and find out you don't want to really get to the thick of things. And so business plan competitions can be a great way to do that. Taking courses like the, um, I guess, Lean Launchpad, it's called, like, that's a very intensive mm -hmm. situation where you're um, stim simulating this, this startup. Um, and really get to know um, this person you're working with in the context of starting a company. Um, and then the, the team can matter so much. And then you have to you know, hire great people outside of that. But starting with that core um, founding team is really, really important. So let's see. Snaps to that one. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great answer. All right, wonderful. Let's uh, thank this panel before we <laughs>